And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. this point in the show uh we are going to get in two goodfellas and was john Gotti involved in lufthansa uh one of the things that we are going to talk about is what goodfellas got right what goodfellas got wrong and i could sit here and do a whole entire show on this uh but i'm not going to uh, i just wanted to sort of talk about a couple of different things uh, and just kind of go from there. Uh, so probably the most quotable uh, mob movie in existence and probably the most realistic mob film from at least the vantage point of violence is Goodfellas. And the thing about Goodfellas from the historical viewpoint is how much they indeed actually got wrong. And it's not to diminish the film. And that's really not the case at all. But the fact is, while the story is based on Henry Hill, the realities are simply that Henry Hill was actually a fucking nobody in that life. He really was a nobody. He, I mean, was he an associated member? Absolutely. But by street standards, he really was not anybody that integral to what was going on. He wasn't a wealthy guy, and he never had two dimes to rub together. Uh, this is not a show to, to downgrade the film, but it's to showcase uh, really fact versus fiction. And so where do you begin? And, and the truth is, if you accept that Henry Hill was completely honest uh, and that he was a figure, uh, you know, a head guy or a big guy, then, then it, it, you know, if you believe everything Henry Hill says, then of course it goes down as one of the best films in the history of the genre. But the reality is, is that Henry Hill was a minor player in the grand scheme of things. And I want to take you to a scene, the scene when Henry Hill is in the shower. And he hears about the Lufthansa heist. He begins to cheer on Jimmy. Everybody remembers that scene. But the reality of that scene, you know, is appropriate because if, if you're making a movie, yeah, he's cheering. He's excited because it, it, it actually happened. But in reality, Henry Hill had nothing to do with that heist. Nothing. And he didn't get a dime out of it. And what Goodfellas distorts is that it was, in fact, Tommy D. Simone who can concocted the plan and takes it to Paul Vario. Paulie did not want Tommy DeSimone pulling that job, and he explains to him that once Jimmy Burke gets out of prison, because at the time Jimmy was in prison, once he gets out, he wants Jimmy to take over the planning of the heist and put it all together. And those are the little facts that the movie doesn't really quite explain. Another great part of the film, at least one of the most talked about sequences, is the murder of Billy Batts, played by Frank Vincent. The reality is, not only does the movie exploit reality, but the authors in the mob genre newbies fail to explain the background of what that situation really fucking was. So Billy Batts, real name, William Bent Vena. And you can see it on the screen if you're following along. He was a Gotti associate, a Gambino associate. He had just gotten out of prison for narcotics. But let's talk about the reality of what happened. Prior to going away on a narcotics charge, his rackets, specifically loan sharking, were actually handed to Jimmy Burke. They were actually given to Jimmy Burke. And Jimmy Burke was an associated member of the Lucchese crime family. Why those rackets were handed over to Jimmy likely had more to do with the fact that Jimmy was universal. Meaning, while he was an associated member of the Lucchese crime family, he was also a freelance guy. He could work with anybody. 
So as Benvena gets out of prison, he expects money and he expects to get his loan sharking racket back. The problem was Jimmy Burke had turned that loan sharking operation into a million dollar operation. So under Jimmy Burke, it was more profitable. And what happened that night at Henry Hill's bar was an escalation of events that the public and authors and mob genre newbies just don't get right. And you know the famous line, go get your fucking shine box. It never happened. The facts of that night, you're about to hear. So when Billy Bats gets out, as I said, he expects his rackets back. He goes to see Jimmy Burke at Henry's bar. When he approaches Jimmy about the issue, Jimmy tells him basically to go fuck himself. And Jimmy could do that because the profits that he turned over to the Gambinos made everybody happy. Bent Vena, who was close to John Gotti, disagreed with that. So Bent Vena leaves and he allegedly goes to see John Gotti or somebody other than Gotti. I'm not sure if it was Gotti, I gotta be honest, but he went to go see somebody about it. And what people failed to mention is that John Gotti was in a position, you know, where he worked with Jimmy Burke at JFK and the two knew each other well. Gotti was not in a position at that time to order the death or to oversee a beef. Whatever Gotti did tell Billy Bats, we're never going to know because we weren't there. Obviously, the loan sharking racket was going to stay put in Jimmy's control. Now, why would they take away something that Jimmy was making them millions of dollars off of? And that's where people sort of, in their own way, get this twisted. Because a lot of people say, well, John Gotti killed him. John Gotti killed uh, Tommy D. Simone over all of this crazy shit, and this is what it had to do with. But John Gotti is not going to kill Jimmy Burke, number one. Number two, you take a guy who wasn't making a lot of money with a loan shark and racket, you hand it to Jimmy Burke to oversee it, and now they're making millions upon millions. Why on earth are they going to give it back to Billy Bats at that point? They're not going to. So like I said, I'm not exactly sure what John Gotti or whoever else uh, representative of the Gambino said to Billy Bats, but either way, it was going to stay put. But the answer is simply, like I said, is they're not going to take it from Jimmy Burke. Uh, Billy Bats, who gets pissed off, goes back to see Jimmy to complain once again. And he walks in, he's pissed off, he enters the bar, he sees Jimmy. And Jimmy already knew ahead of time that Billy Bats had gone back and complained to the Gambino crime family about him, which infuriated Jimmy Burke to no end. So when Benvena comes back into the bar that night in question, looking for trouble, Jimmy Burke was ready for it. Words get exchanged. Henry Hill is there. Jimmy Burke is there. And Tommy D. Simone is there. And they're just waiting for Billy Bats to complain. And he does. And Jimmy Burke begins to pistol whip and beat Billy Bats. And Tommy does help out. And the beating was awful. And he dies as a result. The body was dismembered and ditched. The trunk scene from Goodfellas never happened. He was wrapped in a rug and he was taken out the back door and buried. Dismembered and buried. Tommy never had a beef with Ben Vena other than just defending Jimmy Burke. Now where the story seems to twist is that the Gambinos were pissed once Ben Vena disappeared. They wanted answers. And this is when the premise in the film for why Tommy D. Simone gets killed this is why this comes up. And that's so far from the truth. It's laughable. Some have even made the claim that John Gotti shot and killed Tommy for the death of uh, Billy Bats and for the death of Foxy Jethro. The Jethro issue, issue was over a girl. Tommy was dating Foxy's sister and was regularly beating her up. 
When Foxy found out, he wanted to kill Tommy, but Tommy gets to him first. It's a separate issue. It didn't help that Tommy was a cokehead. And the mob look, looked at him specifically like a loose cannon. He was on drugs, he beat women, and he knew about the Lufthansa heist. These are all a culmination of events which are going to get Tommy D. Simone in trouble. And he becomes a problem for Jimmy in a million different ways. Now, the story gets warped, as I said, about John Gotti, Tommy, and Jimmy. Reality is, Jimmy was killing everybody that was associated with this heist. Everybody. Anybody that, that, that you know, sort of was going to get a kickback off of this was going to get killed. Just the bottom line. Why pay a cut to somebody when you just kill them and not pay them a fucking dime? Why give anybody a cut? But because Tommy hit Foxy, there was a death warrant on his head. Gotti was no dummy. And I have to believe that, that he knew Benvena, Benvena uh, had belly ached. So if he didn't go directly to Gotti and he went to somebody else, I'm sure Gotti knew about it, that he was belly aching about the issue. But Benvena disappearing had everything to do with his complaints and belly aching than anything else. And I think Gotti knew goddamn well who killed Billy Batts and why he disappeared. Because Gotti and Burke were too close for that not to be the case. Now, Jimmy, knowing that Tommy killed Foxy Jethro, knowing that Tommy had problems, he acts first to save himself any more fucking headaches. He sent word he wanted to see Tommy at his house. And on the night of January 14th of 1979, Tommy arrives, he sits down in Jimmy's kitchen. And when he's not looking, Jimmy pulls out a 38 and blows his fucking head off. His body was dismembered and his parts were sent to a scrapyard. John Gotti did not kill Tommy D. Simone. Nobody else did it but Jimmy. And it handled all of Jimmy's problems. It was an eye for an eye and satisfied the Gambinos. Anybody who says otherwise doesn't understand the life at all. I'm just telling you the truth. Another facet of this film that they get wrong is when it comes to Paul Vario. Henry didn't meet Paulie at any cab stand. In fact, he actually meets Jimmy through Tommy, and then through Jimmy, he meets Tootie, then eventually Paulie. All of these ideas that, that Henry Hill and Polly were, were close was a complete fabrication of events that never happened. Henry was associated with Jimmy Burke, not the Lucchese crime family. So much was woven throughout the film about Henry being tight with all of these Lucchese associates. And he knew people 100%, don't get me wrong. But it was his association with Jimmy Burke that was important, not Paul Vario. In fact, he was never an associated member on record with the Lucchese crime family, but he was an associate of Jimmy Burke. He worked for Jimmy Burke, not Paul Vario. So what was John Gotti's role in Lufthansa? Because that it seems to be what a lot of people want to know. And simple, he was a cleanup guy. As you know, Stax Edwards, who drove the getaway van, was supposed to drop the van back into New Jersey, where John Gotti was waiting for him at a scrapyard. John's job was to make sure that the van got crushed and disappeared. Instead of heading to New Jersey after the job, Stax goes and gets high and hangs out with a girl, falls asleep. And as a result of his negligence, the feds not only find the fan, but they get fingerprints. A few hours after the heist, John Gotti waits and waits and waits and waits. And as it got later and later, he makes a call to Vinny Asaro. And he explains, uh, Stax never showed. And he tells John, go home, don't worry about it. A few days later, Stax is killed. And that's really how that went down. Now, Henry Hill never killed nobody, but he was at the scene of several murders. However, oftentimes Henry Hill would brag about murders, but the reality is 
In his paperwork, he he was never accused of a murder. In fact, in his paperwork, most of the crimes he ever committed were basically drug offenses, extortion, credit card scams, and etc. In fact, in Hill's paperwork, the information that he did provide was circumspect in terms of what information he could provide on Paul Vario. And most of that information about Paul Vario was fourth-hand accounts. And there was not really enough evidence to substantiate any of it. However, where Hill was imperative to the prosecution was in terms of Jimmy Burke. And reality is, especially if you know the right people to ask, Henry Hill was a hanger-on with a little business acumen uh, and, and didn't know how to make money. All the scenes in Goodfellas which show a half-wealthy Henry Hill are, are exploitations of the truth. And what people rarely, rarely discuss is how, uh, how much money he owed loan sharks. He owed Jimmy a ton of money, and his schemes were not paying off in any sense. Drugs? Yeah, Henry Hill did, did more blow than he ever sold. Those scenes with the girl in the hat, it's all bullshit. While Henry, while Henry dabbled in moving drugs, it wasn't his operation, but the operation of other people. Henry put the people together and took a small cut, which he put up his fucking nose. It further backs up what others have said, is that Paul Vario wouldn't have let anyone doing drugs like Hill and Tommy Simone live very long. And especially wouldn't let them in his house. And most of Hill's story can be refuted so much so that he appears he was merely just a guy people felt bad for. They end up making a mole out of a mountain. And for the detractors who are going to say, well, he did put away 50 people, including Vario and Burke, I have this to say to you. The information about Burke was because Henry was around him day after day after day, but Paul Vario had a gazillion charges pending against him, put against him, that Hill had no knowledge of or involvement in. In fact, if you look at the case, the only information that Henry Hill provided against Paul Vario, which proves he wasn't around him to the extent that he claims, was that Paul Vario got him early release by setting up a fake restaurant job. So you people are going to say, well, then they knew each other. Yes, they knew each other. They weren't that type, but they were trying to do him a favor. But because Paul Vario does that favor for him, he gets four years in prison. So ask yourself this, surely if Henry Hill knew Paul Vario to the extent so well that he claimed he could have buried him and he didn't because he could not provide actual fucking intel because he wasn't around Paul Vario. His second set of charges were for extortion, Paul Vario, and which Hill did testify about. But it was other witnesses who were used in that trial that had firsthand information about that extortion. And under questioning, Henry Hill admitted that he didn't know the specifics, but believed it to be true. So once again, they're, they're using, oh, do you think this is true? Oh, I think it is. So let's hammer him. Wire taps and witnesses hammered Paul Vario for 14 years in prison. Henry Hill had little to nothing to do with putting Paulie Vario away. Hill did more damage to Jimmy Burke than anybody else. And that was because he was directly associated with Jimmy Burke and not Paul Vario. And so while history is always going to love this film, and, you know, rightfully so, the realities of those stories are steeped in a lot of Hill's imagination more so than in reality. And we talk all the time about informants perjuring themselves online. Go watch Howard Stern videos and the stories Henry Hill tells. It's ludicrous. It's insane. And it's not to take away that Henry Hill wasn't an associated member because he was, at least, on the fringe. But that film made him into some kind of mob juggernaut that he never fucking was. And it's a great film. And I'm not trying to destroy the myth of the film. It's a fantastic film. But the reality of who Henry Hill really was, the reality of the things that they had to do to make the story more palatable, because of course it makes sense. Henry owns a bar. Billy Bats comes in. He runs his mouth at Tommy, who's a fucking maniac. Tommy kills him. Now they got a big problem because this other crime family is going to be upset. So from a from a, a writing aspect, you have to do it that way because the truth wouldn't make any fucking sense. Because in that film, Jimmy Burke is not nearly as violent as Tommy, but in, in all honesty, it's flipped. 
Tommy was a crazy fuck. Don't get me wrong. But Jimmy was more violent than Tommy. Tommy had like intermittent explosive temper, whereas Jimmy just would kill you. And there were nine murders. I think nine to 11, something like that. After Lufthansa heist. Jimmy killed everybody that was owed money because he didn't want to fucking pay him. And Henry Hill in, in, in that weaving, uh, woven tapestry that we know of Lufthansa had nothing to do with nothing. It was all Tommy, Tommy D. Simone's idea, his plan. He gives it to Jimmy after Paul tells him to. And the rest is history. And the proof is always in the paperwork. That's what I always say. The proof is in the paperwork. Of the paperwork that I was able to acquire about Henry Hill, if he was as tight with Paul Vario as he claimed, Paul Vario, after that first trial, forget about it. Four years, whatever. 14 years, he would have gotten fucking life without like 70 fucking indictment charges. 120 charges on an indictment. But it's because Henry Hill didn't know him like that, wasn't exactly as close as he claimed. He couldn't provide the information. Other people had to. And that's just the truth. It's a great story, but that's what it is. It's a fucking story. Nothing more. Nothing less. All right, so that's what we have to say about the Lufthansa heist. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to get into the Philadelphia Mob War of 1990. And it's going to be a several-part series, probably three.